Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate and the MMA detective back here on the Lights Out podcast, and we're in deep dive territory again. Chris Lytle has us on assignment, and uh, Mike... We're in rare air this time. We've got, as a guest, Dr. Ron Tripp. And it may not be a familiar name to everybody, but it will be by the end of this, I assure you. Uh, yes. My, you know, Mike and I, were, we're talking about this. You know, we've got, like, MMA pioneers and stuff. And I believe, analyzing it, that we will all come to the conclusion that Dr. Ron Tripp is one of the forefathers of modern MMA. He, he came Agreed. a little bit before... The 93 UFC, he was already done with his competition career, but he was very active and aware of everything going on with the wrestlers, the judo, the sambo. He was right at the nexus of it. He was a very important person. And uh, I think we're all going to learn a lot. So, Mike, take it away. And yeah, Dr. So Ron, Richard, hello. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, you know, I, we really appreciate you joining us. A lot of our audience, Truth be told, we've got a pretty hardcore audience, so most of them would be familiar with your name. But, you know, our goal was to kind of introduce you to people that might not be familiar, you know, with your body of work. And where it stands out for me is obviously your your Sambo career. You're the f I think you're the first American to ever compete in Sambo here and go to Russia and compete at a very high level there as well. Am I correct when I say that? Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> Possibly in Russia. Greg Gibson was also a very successful uh, Sambo competitor. And I believe he won the gold, uh, the gold medal at the World Cup or possibly the World Championships. But, you know, Greg was an outstanding athlete. I mean, one of the few guys in the history of wrestling that had world medals in Sambo, Greco, and freestyle. And just a class act guy. And we thank him for his service in the United States Marine Corps. He was... Uh, definitely a, a leader in the wrestling world and, and he had a lot of success in sambo but um i think as far as really working with the russians um i there was a point in time where no one could beat him so i would just train with him so you know it's like everyone is fighting for the silver at some point in time were they friendly with you in regards to training or do you think you were kind of like you know shark tank the new guy in the room no not really and I, but i think it came after um i finally had earned a world medal I Took second in the world in 88 in Montreal. And um, a lot of guys competed differently. You know, I'd come from wrestling, you know, how wrestlers are. I mean, since I am one, I can talk about us. But, uh, you know, wrestlers are the kind of guys that you don't have to ask them twice if they want to fight to go, well, let me check my watch. Yeah, I got time. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think wrestlers, say, let's, let's see what you got today. And that's how I've always coached. And I think the Russians and the other uh, Eastern Bloc countries appreciated the fact that, that, you know, I came here to win and I wasn't happy just being part of the team. And, and I, I was blessed to have some of the opportunities and uh, be in the right position at the right time and had great coaches. That's what, that's what got me where I was at. Now you guys, like right when mixed martial arts first kind of came in, the Sambo guys used to kind of like, stick their nose up at the jujitsu people and the, uh, the jujitsu I, I sport because you guys look at it as kind of being soft. That's at least my limited understanding of Sambo and that community at this time. Am I correct when I say that? Well, I, I think so to some degree, you know, Mike, it was um, uh, interesting that you brought that up because the first time I competed against uh, Higgin Marchado, uh, I was probably overconfident and didn't really have any worries about, uh, I fought him in the Pan Am finals that was held in Kentucky, actually Cincinnati area. And I knew he had submissions and stuff, but I didn't realize how good the jujitsu techniques were. And so we went to the mat and I was fairly confident that at least it'd be a break even or, or to my advantage and, uh, and was certainly wrong. And Higgin and I became great friends. We're still great friends today. We don't talk as much as we used to, but, uh, He's a great champion, great individual. His family, Jack and Ricardo, those guys are just great people. But, yeah, I was probably one of those guys that didn't think jiu-jitsu really uh, was all that because it was dragging guys down to the ground. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that was probably initially the general attitude about uh, um, jiu-jitsu because it wasn't a rock and roll, 
Motown, crunk gym boxing type thing, or it wasn't, uh, you know, Bruce Lee. And there, there was such a small Sambo community, and most of the people that said they did Sambo more often than not were lying. You know, they just, you know, watched a couple of videos, and, you know, it's kind of like, well, I come from a judo background. Well, unless you got a number on the back of your gi, and you're in a class with people with numbers on the back of their gi, yeah, you, you're not really a, a judo guy, at least yeah. in today's day and age. That's that's a, that's a great summarization of it for sure. I mean, uh, you know, you hear things, especially traveling, you know, uh, I'll have guys that come up to me and go, well, you know, I was a MMA fighter and I almost got my pro card. And I go, you got what? They go, you know, my pro card. And I go, okay. And I just, I'll let, I just let those things go, you know, yeah. but yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of guys out there, we had a young man training with us that told me he was taking judo in another town. He goes, I'm getting ready to take my, test and they told me to make black belt i have to get punched in the throat five times i went really hmm must be a new kind of judo i think you find that in any aspect i've, I've had guys tell me oh you know i was ranked number one in in the state of michigan or number one in the state of ohio uh in wrestling until i got my knee twisted you know, everybody's got an injury that took them out of being an Olympic champion or someone's got an uncle that was an Olympic champion because they saw the trophies. That's always the best one. Yeah, I saw the trophy I got from the Olympics. Okay. You know, well, you know one, of, one of the things that made Sambo in that area legitimate, and it was a very small community, was the, the presence of David Rudman. Am I correct? That's correct. David Rudman had Sambo 70 in Moscow. And even more than that, David was... Uh, Really, uh, kind of like Okano from Japan, he he believed Sambo was a worldwide sport, as Okano believed uh, uh, that it was a, as well, judo should be a worldwide sport. And I think with David Rudman's influence, uh, Sambo was able to expand and able to, uh, to find, you know, new homes like in the U.S. and in France and in Canada. Yeah. Why do you think Sambo hasn't taken off like the sport of jiu-jitsu has here in the United States? Well, you know, Mike, I'll tell you, it's kind of a crazy thing. Rich Bender and I were talking at, I think, the 2008 Olympic trials. We were doing a joint uh, competition at the MAC Center in Las Vegas. And I told him, I said, you know, I, I truly have come to believe that there's only a certain percent of the population that really is comfortable with getting punched or kicked in the head or thrown on, on your head. And I have people all the time said to me so like you go to this guy's arm or you know you, this guy he just slammed you and didn't bother you and I go, yeah it bothered me but it's just part of the deal and like oh no i want nothing to do with that and i just think that you have the combative sports in my opinion you know boxing the, the contact sports karate then you've got judo sambo wrestling greco and i think there's just a, a certain percent of the population that's drawn to being comfortable in that environment and those numbers can only get spread so thin you know, you look at France's judo program, unbelievable. Freestyle wrestling, not so good. You know, you look at uh, Germany, kind of a balance there, but pretty much their their judo has been dominant. Same with Brazil. Brazil has great judo champions. And their freestyle wrestling is just, you know, up and coming. And uh, their jiu-jitsu is big. And so, yeah, I just think there's a certain percent of the population that's out there that stay with you to the world-level gold-level matches. When you're in a gold medal match and you're looking at where the countries are from, those countries are usually pretty strong in that discipline. And, you know, I think America, that we're amateur sports for the most part, I think we've done really well, considering there was a time when, you know, the Eastern Bloc was basically funded as military soldiers that, that did, did judo or did wrestling or did weightlifting or whatever. And so you're competing against professionals. And my coach, Lenny Polyakov, second time I fought for the world title, uh, he was – a little bit nervous and he said hey you know now these guys do this for a living you have to go back to a regular job on monday and uh and i said yeah okay and i understood that and and basically what he was saying is that this is what these guys do when you're in your office being a chiropractor or coaching wrestling these guys are spending the entire day focusing on on winning this match because that's how they get paid and so there, there, there was a separation there and i think the u.s has done very well considering the fact that we've taken an amateur so-called approach to uh to Olympic sports and world sports. I would have thought, I mean, at least by now, because especially with all the 
I mean, it's almost like a Russian invasion, but the Eastern Bloc coming into the, you know, sport of mixed martial arts. I, I had would have thought by now Sambo tournaments, although people might not be actively practicing Sambo in the gym, but like you were doing, you were crossing over from Sambo into jujitsu tournaments. I thought there may have been a like exchange and just like an attention to the rule set. Um, well, there is Mike to a certain point, you know, um, basically I trained judo most of the time and I'll give you a brief background of how I ended up. With Sambo. Of course I was wrestling. I came to the university of Oklahoma to train for the Olympic trials for 1980. We boycotted the games. I took two years off and my accountant said, Hey, you know, uh, you were on the wrestling staff at OU. And I said, yeah. And he goes, did you ever think about doing any judo? And he started telling me about it. I said, no, I know what judo is. I said, Jimmy Woolley, who was a two-time Olympian, was in chiropractic school with me. And he and I would work out together because he didn't have anybody to work out with in Davenport, Iowa. And neither did I. And so I'd done some judo and I'd done a couple of local tournaments. And uh, Jimmy had introduced me to a couple people. And I ended up doing judo in Norman, Oklahoma. And met Pat Burris, who became my coach and one of my closest, if not my closest friend. And uh, Pat said, hey, we're going to go to the Sambo tournament up in Kansas City. And I said, what? And he goes, yeah, that's what we're going to do. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to put the jacket on. They, they had to dress me when I got ready to fight. Long story <laughs> short, I, I took third uh, in 1985 in the Nationals. First time I'd ever seen the sport. And lost to uh, Shepard Pittman from Missouri, who was a wrestler. He went on to take a third in the world. The next year, I didn't compete. The following year, I went to the Nationals and won it. Went and took fifth in the World Cup, and you know it, it just kind of went from there. So I would train judo primarily ninety percent of the time, and then sambo ten percent of the time. But my wrestling background also gave me the experience and the awareness of anything that might happen that wasn't transitioned from judo to sambo. Wow, that's excellent. You were also the assistant wrestling coach at University of Oklahoma from nineteen eighty two to nineteen ninety five under Stan Abel. Stan Abel is one of those names that, historically speaking, is incredibly important. How did you guys meet, and what was your relationship like? Well, Stanley, Stanley's the best. Uh, he called yesterday, and I missed his call, but um, it's it just a crazy thing. When Andre was inducted into the National Wrestling Hall of Fame in Stillwater, I, I talked about the things in life that change people, and I said, you know, my life is different because of Andre Metzger. Andre Metzger. Okay, cool. And I... Uh, I was coaching Andre when he was 15 years old, and uh, the story's a little hilarious. I went back to wrestle in the Michigan Open. And I kept calling Andre, his father was a tournament director, and this kid on the phone just kept wearing me out. I said, I'm going to kill him. When I get up there, I'm going to find this kid, and I'm going to kill him. So I go up, and I win the tournament, and his dad says, hey, would you think about coaching my son? I said, which one? And he goes, Andre. And I said, no, 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 not Andre. No, no, give me Mike or give me Kenny, not Andre. So Andre and I end up in this relationship where his dad just goes, either you're going down to Detroit with Ron Tripp or you're not, or you're not sleeping in the house. So I take him down to Detroit. We go to the, uh, at that time, what they call Fargo. Now we go to the wrestling junior nationals and eventually Andre wins uh, five out of six titles while I'm coaching and becomes the first five time winner winning freestyle and Greco. And he was being recruited highly recruited by a lot of colleges. He comes to Oklahoma and he goes, look, we started this thing together. Why don't you come down here and we'll try to help you get set up and practice and we'll we'll take a shot at the 80 Olympic Games together. And that's how I ended up. Well, Stan. Wait, wait, you know, wait, wait, wait. So Andre Metzger was such a hot recruit that they took the coach with the student. Somewhat. Yeah. Andre was the number one recruit in the country. Andre, wow. when he was 17 years old, he wasn't even out of high school yet. And he beat Vladimir Human to death. Human was the defending Olympic champion when there was one Russia. And Andre went to wrestling in the Super Cup in Tokyo. And I can't remember how far ahead he was. He was ahead like 17 to four or something. And Human kicked him and Andre broke his leg. 17 year old kid. Holy cow. Yeah. Uh, when Andre won his first national Greco title, it was against the young man he competed with earlier in the tournament. And he got a bad call. And Andre goes, well, that's not gonna happen this time. I'm gonna break his neck. I said, no, you just go out there and wrestle and do what I tell you to do. Well, he went out there and broke his neck and came off and said, I told you I was going to break his neck. Andre Metzger, unbelievable as a competitive athlete. And so Andre Metzger, just so our audience knows, he's a two-time national champion. And 
he never won the Olympic gold. Correct. Is he one of those people that you think may have fallen short in his wrestling career? No, not at all. Andre beat so many Olympic champions. His Olympic progression kind of went like this. Andre was a three-time NCAA finalist and uh, lost to Leroy Smith in uh, his sophomore year, then won it uh, two years back-to-back over Glenny Zaleski from Iowa. And Andre uh, was uh, in the 84 trials. He was on some type of a supplement that gave him a bleeding ulcer. And he got sick and was still trying to compete. And as I understood it, and I didn't get a chance to talk to Bill Clancy about it, Bill was the head physician for the Olympic Committee, but they medically disqualified him from the trials, just removed him, said, you're, you're not going to compete. And I really feel that Andre would have won the 84 games. Andre uh, had beaten Andy Ryan from Wisconsin, and Andy was a great athlete, but Andre had dominated him, beat him by 13, 14 points every time they wrestled. And then in 88, probably two months prior to the uh, Olympic trials, Andre was working out with Mark Schultz and sustained a knee injury. And so I sent him up and Dr. Clancy did the arthroscopic knee surgery on him. And he goes, Hey, here's what you can do. And maybe he'll be ready. Maybe he won't. So Andre literally came back to Norman, Oklahoma, and we were together 24 seven attempting to get him ready. And, you know, I didn't know what he was going to do, but conditioning was certainly a challenge because he couldn't run. He really couldn't wrestle. And we, we took a stationary bike and set it up on a table and he would just power grind it with his arms. And that was part of his cardio. And long story short, we go to the trials. He takes second to Nate Carr. We, I don't think he'd ever lost to before. We'd beaten Nate our entire career. And, and it was disappointing. And then, as you know, you mentioned that uh, earlier that he came back at age 54. It was in the final Olympic trials in Greco-Roman. Just an unbelievable athletic uh, career, you know. So, I mean, just so people at home, at the age of 54, 2012 Greco-Roman Olympic trials. He was one match short of uh, placing. Yeah, he was 54 years of age. That's yep. how tough. Like, I have to imagine when you read a stat like that, that's how haunted Andre Metzger was for not going to the Olympics. Like, at the age of 54, he couldn't handle it still. <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was so much that. You know, Andre loves the sport. and He's a, he's a competitor. He yeah. is probably greatest student of the sport I've ever met. Wade Chalice is, is also a great student of the sport, a great thinker. But Andre was a better referee than most of the guys refereeing his matches. And every year, his first obligation was to study the rules for the year. And that always impressed me. The other thing that impressed me is when Andre was, when we first were together, I started coaching him. I said, okay, Andre, now, if I'm going to waste my time, exactly what, you know, what do you want to be? And he goes, I want to be the best in the world. And I said, well, okay, so what are you, you going to do? And he sat there and he said the most profound thing for a 15-year-old kid. And he goes, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll sacrifice whatever I have to sacrifice. And coming from a 15-year-old kid, you usually hear, I'll do 1,000 push-ups. I'll run 200 miles a day. He said, the door's open. You tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it if, if it makes me the best in the world. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. just a ultimate competitor. That's how it is. You open the door, Ron, I, I must admit, I am obsessed with the Schultz brothers, you know, <laughs> partic- particularly Mark. So, you know, I, obviously, you, Higan Machado, I'd like to revisit that a little bit. Higson Gracie, um, your match with him, but also with Mark and Dave Schultz, I'd like to kind of take a little bit of a slow walk. So, in essence, you're at the University of Oklahoma. Dave Schultz leaves Oklahoma State, takes a year off. Mark is at UCLA. Everybody wants wants Dave, but Mark is 18 and 8 as a freshman at UCLA. Did you guys know the type of talent that Mark was, or was it kind of a byproduct of accepting him because you wanted the brother? Well, you know, that, and I could certainly jump on that bandwagon, but I, I wasn't on it. I'm, I'm aware of what, that the decision was somewhat along that line. Uh, Stan Abel and, and Jim Humphrey really were the ones that were involved in getting in Dave and Mark to come. And probably Hump, you know, Hump was pushing the freestyle program, which is another reason I was glad to come here. And Jim did a great job with bringing a lot of athletes that may not have been totally on the radar as far as being great and insane yeah and i mean you know we had roger frizzell who just retired from Connell cruise lines 
four-time All-American, would have been a four-time national champ in any era that didn't include Kenny Mundy and Nate Carr in his weight class. And we had Mesker, we had Israel Shepard, two-time junior college state champ comes in, uh, only lost his start to uh, Ricky Stewart from Oklahoma State. Israel, great competitor. We had Jimmy Hall, who was one of the top Greco guys. We had Greg Baker, who was uh, one of the top Greco guys in the country, went on to win national titles. You know, we had Steve, Dr. Death Williams, who people thought was just a heavyweight. Good God, he, he couldn't even be on a wrestling scholarship because of his football talent. And he ended up with only about 50 matches in his NCAA career because he didn't start till after uh, the December 1st. And he wrestled Bedlam, go play the football bowl game, then come back and wrestle. And four-time All-American, and I think two-time national finalist. And so those guys had a great ability to, to seek out talent. And Jerry Stanley was on the coaching staff as well. And I, I was just blessed. You know, Stan called me and said, hey, we'd have you down here. Now, I'm a kid from Detroit, Michigan. They went to school in an area where everybody said, you can't do anything. You're from Lake Orion. You'll go to General Motors and work. Then you'll retire. Then you'll go somewhere into a small cabin up north and die. And I, and I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go to college and give it my best shot. Thought I wanted to be a pharmacist. And when that wasn't for me, I said, you know, I really want to coach. I want to help kids. And I said, if I'm the luckiest guy in the world, maybe for just one year, my bucket list will be full. If I can go back to Lake Orion and be the head wrestling coach for one year. High school wrestling coach for one year. That, that was my target. Mm -hmm. And 10 years later, I'm down at the University of Oklahoma, one of the top programs in history. You know, eventually Olympic and world champions all over the place. Well, I, I think only one time you guys placed out of the top 10. Uh, that was like 91, I want to say. Yeah, and then, you know, that was the end of Stan's coaching career. When, man, when we were there, you know, we were, you know, we were second to Iowa, I think, four times. And both teams, Iowa and Oklahoma, our, our team scores surpassed the winning score of the previous year. And one year, it was almost like a dual meet. I mean, it came that close. I mean, or, or maybe in the top four. The, the finals and the constellations came down to like an Iowa – Oklahoma dual meet with some other people uh, in there being a factor from some other schools. But, you know, Stan opened the door and it, it was, it was just unbelievable. I just, I was always being from Detroit. I was a little hesitant. And I'd spoken with Tommy Chesper about coming to Oklahoma state. Cause I had a kid I coached up there. He was from Kansas and he went to OSU and, and they made some opportunity offers and being from Detroit, I went, nah, that ain't happening. <laughs> And the truth was, it could have happened, but I got to Norman, Oklahoma, and it was more of, of what I was used to as far as growing up in the Detroit area. And Stan didn't promise me hardly anything at all except an opportunity and that I could drive one of the school transportation vehicles when, when the wrestling team wasn't using it, and that he would help me get my practice started and, and, uh, uh, and help him with, you know, be the coach that I wanted to kind of see from my end when it was all said and done. And he's done all that. We remain great friends through the years. So with Mark Schultz, essentially the entire country wants Dave. Dave Schultz leaves his original college because a guy named Mike Sheets is there. And he's having some issues. He doesn't think he's going to be able to crack the lineup. Or it was – he wasn't going to get the mat time that he had desired, so he leaves. Right. He hooks up with, with his brother. He comes as a – they come as a package. Now, I, I think the thing – from our perspective, the important thing to remember is Mark started wrestling his junior year of high school, never won any of the major tournaments, including his senior year up, but he just kept getting better. And he eventually took state in California. When did you realize Mark was a legit top tier prospect on that Oklahoma team? Well, I'll tell you, you know, Mark is such an amazing person off the mat. You know, he, Mark and I developed a really close relationship because like Mark, I didn't wrestle until I was a senior. And so people are surprised, though, did you start doing wrestling and judo and everything when you were like five years old? No, I was a track and field athlete and decided I was going to wrestle because I didn't like basketball anymore. And so I, I really kind of, you know, bought into Mark's deal because I knew emotionally where he was at mentally, how it is to try to fight, fight your way in. So we, we worked out a lot together. Um, and. It, it was always a pleasure. Mark was a, a great room competitor, as was Dave, but two completely different personalities. But I'm telling you, you know, Mark's gymnastic background, I think when you and I spoke before, I'd mentioned this. Yeah. His flexibility and strength through flexibility was one of the craziest things I had ever seen in my life. I had no idea 
how gymnastic strength would convert into a sport like wrestling. And I'm telling you, Mark was just as strong as his back was two inches off the ground as if he was standing up trying to squeeze you. I mean, it was, it was a once in a athlete. I can tell you that for sure. And he just had an awareness about his body. And I think his gymnastics background really helped him a lot. And then it was just a matter of understanding that it's just about position. You got to beat your opponent's position, Mark. You know, got that game plan in his head. And he had an unbelievable coach in his corner named Dave. You know, Mark's biggest fan was his brother, Dave. And Dave just, I think Dave had more passion for Mark winning than he had for himself winning. And that was my view from the outside. But two completely different individuals. If you'd done interviews. They're yin and the yang. They're yin and the yang. You agree? Yeah. I just, Mark and I competed with a lot of anger initially. And, and Dave said to me, he goes, you're always so angry when you competing. It's like you want to kill the guy. And I go, yeah, I do. And Dave said, you know, there's only so much hate that you got in your body and it's all gone. And you got nothing left. He goes, what I do is I figure out what I want to take him down with and I make it a game. And every time I take him down, a little voice inside me starts laughing. And I just see how many times I can do that before they figure it out. And he goes, and usually by the end of the match, I win. And I thought, you know, what a neat perspective. And I transformed that into my coaching philosophies when I coach guys. I said, winning and losing are just two words. They, they mean nothing whatsoever. They're the result of what happens of your time out there on the, on the mat or in the cage or in the ring. And I said, focus on what you do. Do it repeatedly until it doesn't work and then change off. And that was directly from Dave, Dave Schultz. People ask me if that was my line of thought. Absolutely not. Dave Schultz is the one that said, hey, just do that one thing that keeps working until it doesn't. And what a simple, simple competitive premise to take the heat off yourself, you know? Mm. The thing, like, what I try to explain to people with Dave and Mark is Dave is a guy that's built like a chemistry teacher, obviously. Pure technique is what got him where he's at. And he would calm you down and lull you into just kind of bringing your defense down. And then he would go in for the kill to where Mark, Mark is just an, just an SOB, man. Like, the oh. easiest person for Mark to beat is the pure athlete. Because yeah. he would turn their pockets inside out. Oh, yeah. You know, Mark, Mark just, you know, he, as I do, he, he enjoyed making you pay for being on the mat. And I did, too. So, you know, you don't have to show up. You know, you can stand on the side. You can tell your coach you don't feel good. But if you come across there, I've made a lot of sacrifices to train and compete and time away from my business, time away from my daughter. I raised her by myself. And believe me, I had the thought someone was going to pay for that. And I looked for, and I looked forward to the competitions. It was like a vending for me, and I think it was for Mark as well. Yeah, you know, so Dave, his easiest co- opponent was somebody that was just angry, mean, and tough. It's it just they had each other to work against. It's just the perfect yin and the yang. Yeah. And Dave, but, you, yes. No, I, I was just going to ask you, Ron, from your perspective. You know, Dave is the one whose life is, is, is the one that everybody knows, you know, Memorialized. And, it's, and it's not just because he, you know, of the way that he was killed. It's also because, you know, he's the guy who knew Russian. He's the guy who was personable. He's actually the guy that managed the Fox catcher relationship. The other wrestlers right. didn't like to talk. It was Dave who did the talking, you know? So he was the personable person. All that aside, personalities <laughs> aside, just sheer wrestler. Is Mark better than Dave? You would know better than I, but I'm, I'm of the impression that, that that's a possibility. And I don't know yeah. that a lot of people say that. Well, you know, the, and that's a good question. It's also a very tough question because, as Mike said, there was such a, a difference between their styles. Dave, when I talk about him being a student like Wade Chalice is, Dave would not only just study wrestling, he would study uh, inherent reactions to things. One of the things that Dave... Uh, and I were working on one day, which was interesting. He goes, well, no, if you reach over and slap their left hand, he goes, it'll freeze their right leg. And I said, what? And he goes, yeah. He said, you're affecting the cross crawl mechanism. That's how in depth David thought about this. And a lot of the things that Dave did, they weren't wrestler reactions. They were instinctive reactions that people either reacted or didn't react. And so a lot of his things were at a higher level. Mark and I, I think we just got out and wrestled and waited for a guy to do what we thought he was going to do and then scored on him. So 
I don't know. You know, I don't know if Dave would be Mark or Mark would be Dave. I mean, can, can I make an we, argument? Can yeah. I make an argument in regards to this? And I know this is your question. Dave's biggest problem, and I've never met either of these guys. I am mentally ill with studying them. It, you know, and I'm not even a wrestling guy. But Dave's biggest problem is that he loved the sport so much and enjoyed human interaction so much that he would show you how he beat you and how to counter it. Oh, yeah. Like, he would bring you along just so, yeah, yeah, yeah this is how I beat you. See you next week to wrestle again. Yeah, that was Dave, 100%. 100%. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Mark's not going to do that. So if you want to, no, Mark's not, Mark, Mark's, Mark's going to prison. The secret. Yeah, yeah, Mark and I both. We're not going to show you how we got you. No, Dave, you're right. Dave would do that. Dave would, you know, Dave would be, and, and he helped me a lot as far as my anger when I I've got you know, they're great friends. I go to the locker room or something. He'd be right there, and he goes, "This ain't working out, is it?" Now let's just let's just let's just roll with it. And pretty soon, you know, uh, with a lot of the guys, including the Russians. I'd be sitting there talking with him just like Dave would. And they're like, okay, it's time to flip the switch and get on the edge of the mat and turn that thing in and let's go. But no, Dave would sit there and show you exactly how he beats you. I'm not so sure he would show you actually how to do a better job of it. But that's how open he was. He loved the sport. And yeah, just, you know, he, he loved the sport more than he loved winning. Like that's, and, and you're talking about an Olympic athlete, a guy that loved to win, but his love for the sport surpassed anything else in his life. Really did. We talk about uh, talk about the time that Kenny Monday wins the gold, who had beaten Dave from going to the Olympics, and Dave's the first guy on the mat to pick him up, put him on his shoulders. You know, and went to practice, yeah, and continued to go to practice to make him better, yeah. and showed Kenny how to beat him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Dave was such a special guy. You know, Nancy uh, again, such a special person and, and such a perfect fit. You know, but she's really just uh, a, a saint. And, and she was a blessing for Dave and, you know, and, and for Mark. I mean, she was, you know, Dave's wife, but she was also kind of kept an eye on Mark and kept even on guys on the team, like Danny Shake and some other guys, you know, she kind of kept them rounded up and kept them in line. But yeah, I, I think Mark and Dave were just so, so different. Miguel, it's hard to answer that question because, you know, it's kind of like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like putting two different types of, uh, track and field guys against each other, a guy from 100 and a guy from the 200, you know, who really could be the best if they ran four events? I don't know. But they were both, you know, and are in, in history, special wrestlers and certainly uh, changed the lives of a lot of people with their contributions. Well, I mean, now, so Mark Schultz, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Just one of the, uh, you know, one of the things that you brought up too was Dr. Death, Steve Williams. And you've got, you know, he's he's a pro wrestler by for fame, no? But it, we knew he was a decorated wrestler. It, is he your entry into the world of MMA and that interest there? Is that did, did that help, or where, where did that start popping up before I let Mike take over again? I'll, I'll tell you more yeah, Schultz questions. <laughs> yes, no, Steve Williams would have been UFC champion. Steve Williams was an absolute street thug if he had to be. Kindest guy in the world, but you did not want Doc on your wrong side. I think he had the heaviest bench press uh, of all the OU football players. Um, and like I said, I think he wrestled, and I don't remember exactly, but I would think maybe he only wrestled about 50 matches in his college career. You know, he goes out and, uh, you know, and he wrestled some great guys um, in his career. And to come out you know, with no training, come into the Bedlam series, which is usually like, let's just say December 7th, Wrestle the bedlam, goes back, gets ready for the Orange Bowl, and then January turns right around and hits the street as an OU wrestler and is four time All American. I saw Doc in Japan and uh, uh, after I was president of USA Judo and had a chance to talk to him. The last time I saw him face to face before he passed away. And uh, just just the same guy. Just just a sweet guy and a saint. But yeah, Doc was Doc was kind of like a lesson. He's not the kind of guy you want to get crossways with because he could change your life. <laughs> well, in the WWE back, uh, locker room, the high-end wrestlers always said, that's the guy you leave alone. So his, his reputation superseded just what he did on the mat and in, in the wrestling ring, for sure. 
Jim Ross or JR as they call him was from here in Norman, Oklahoma. And of course, JR still does the AEW and all those things. And of course, Bill Watts wrestled for Stan at Oklahoma. And so Doc had the, the just walk in entry into at that time Mid South Wrestling, which was great. Good, good, good. So you're obviously a coach, a student of personalities. Mark Schultz freshman year goes 18 and 8 at 150 pounds, you know, at UCLA. Good season. You know, nothing that people go crazy over, but somebody that can put some work in and do something. Sophomore, junior, and senior year, he takes a national championship after you guys redshirt him. But his junior year at 177, Ed Banish is coming in to become yeah. the first four-time national champion. Yeah. Schultz and him collide. What is Mark's mental mindset? How, how do you help it? Like, Walk us through as a coach watching a guy deal with that type of pressure. Well, you know, Mark is one of those guys, and, and Stan really handled him well in, in the high-anxiety situations. And, you know, most of us just tried to support Mark and, and contribute if he had questions or, or be good workout partners. And, again, you know, Dave was, in my opinion, Dave was a, a big factor in supporting his, his younger brother and, and loved him to death. And Dave would constantly reinforce with Mark, you're the guy, you're the guy, as we did as well. And Stan, like I said, you know, Stan would, would reel him back in. Stan was the, the guy with the Oklahoma accent. Hey, y'all, come on down here. And, and you know, Stan would, would bring the reins back in on him and, and get him back under control. But, you know, Mark had a, had a great passion to be as good as Dave. He loved his brother and he wanted his brother's, you know, recognition for being great. And that was a big driving force for Mark. And it wasn't so much that he felt like he was competing with Dave, but he wanted to, Dave to look at him and say, you know, you're great too. And I think everybody wants that, you know, but, you know, my, my sister, uh, I always want my sister to think that when she hears something about me or, or, or looks at my past, that things, things are something that she's proud of. And I think that drove Mark a lot. And I think the, the perfect situation of being here at the university of Oklahoma with his brother, Dave, in a competitive environment where they're both on the team and they're chasing this dream together, both NCAA champions, both Olympic champions. I think that's a great motivator for young men. When you've got someone that says, let's take this ride together, because that's kind of what Andre and I did when I came to Oklahoma, let's go do this together. And you feel like a little bit of the weight is off your shoulders. And, and Mark was such a special young man to have the opportunity, as I always say, to have a front row seat and watch the ride. I mean, you know, golly, as I said, you talk about talent. Who, who, who throws an inside trip, gets put on your back against Bannock for five, and then comes back in with our body lock series that we, that at that time we were teaching in Oklahoma, and, and Mark, you know, Mark was a master of it. He comes into the inside trip, changes the direct, directions, and puts Bannock on his back. Who does that in the NCAA finals? So, you get, I, I, on your, I, I, I'm not doing it. Man. Mark shared with me uh well, he didn't really share with me. He asked me to ask you to share. You guys had an interchange in an NCAA final where I think he took a timeout or there was a timeout and he was rubbing his knee because <laughs> I think he was trying to buy some time. And uh, he said that you would uh, let him know about it. Why don't you share that incident with us? Oh, God. I was hoping he wouldn't bring this up. <laughs> so anyway, Mark was one of those guys that could only pull this off. So <laughs> he's in the finals. And he turns to the referee and calls. And is this against Ed Banish? Yeah, and he calls timeout and walks away. And you know, you think that they penalize him a point. You know, the ref just follows him over. He sits down and I said, "You know, what's up?" And he goes, "Oh, it's my knee." So I said, "Okay." So I start moving the knee. I start working on the knee, and uh, uh, the ref starts to talk about, "Okay, you got thirty seconds." And Mark looks up at me and he goes, "It's the other knee." <laughs> <laughs> And I don't think it was either knee, but that's fine. So then we so we start the clock. We're working on the other knee. No, that's that was the old injury. This is this is the real injury. And honest to God, he called timeout, walked away from the ref. I couldn't believe it. And I, I laughed about that. Went back to sit down. I said, you know, he just mesmerizes people into in, into the flow. And he did. Yeah, he goes, no, not that knee. It's the other knee. And I just looked at <laughs> God, Mark. <laughs> so for the people at home. Ed Banish is going on to be a four-time national champion, runs into Mark Schultz. Mark almost gets pinned in the opening stanza, ends up winning 16-8. to eight. Some people claim that 
it's one of the greatest college wrestling matches ever to take place in NCAA history. Oh, I agree. I agree. You got a guy that's going to be a four timer when a guy that maybe if he'd have been in the Oklahoma environment, that may have been a four timer, but you got guys that got threes tacked on their career for almost certainly one of them going for a four. And, you know, I don't know if Ed moved up the next year or not because of Mark. Um, but I'm telling you that. He did. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, uh, Sometimes you just got to look at the writing on the wall and say, you know, you want to be remembered as the guy that got slugged it out or the guy that got smart and moved up and won my third NCAA title but, and helped my team out, which is, I'm sure, what the discussion was as well. But, um, yeah, Mark, I, he, he just had no fear. No fear whatsoever. Let's just do it. So even walking into something like that, there's, there's – I mean, the, the mindset is go get them. Yeah, I mean, there's anxiety. You get on an athlete when you're coaching them. And, you know, I always tell my guys all the time, and I don't care if you're at that level or any level, but I'll say to my guys that I'm coaching, uh, you know, I'll say, hey, so are you kind of feeling weird right now? Are you nervous? Like you're, you know, like you're having doubts about yourself? And they go, yeah, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little anxious. I said, good. I said, because, you know, that's normal. There's not a time I ever competed, even to the last match, even against a guy who had never competed, that I didn't have that anxiety. I said, that's just telling you that everything's okay. I said, so just take that little negative voice and say, you go sit over there with all those other people that don't want me to win, and I'll get back to you later. And I always tell my guys, as I would tell Mark, and I said, but you see that guy over there? And he goes, yeah. And I said, his coach didn't tell him it's normal and it's okay. And I said, so let's go have some fun, you know? And, you know, a lot of coaches don't tell you that. You know, they're like, you're going to get this guy. You're going to get this guy, and you're anxious, and you're nervous, and you're, man, did I train enough, you know? Is my, am I going to get tired? Is my weight okay? Am I going to dehydrate? You know, and then you need someone just sit there and goes, hey, you know, Mike, you say, you know, Mike it, it's okay. It's normal. Everybody feels it. And so with that being said, let's go have some fun. Let's score some points on this guy. That's and awesome. you know, have anxiety, but yeah. But no, he went out there. He, he was 90, like anybody, there was a small section of questioning yourself, which everybody has. But, you know, 90, 95% of Mark was, was focused on kicking your butt. So imagine going down 5 nothing against Banish within the first 10 seconds of a match. Oh, man. And just what kind of light switch has got to flip for you to only allow one point from that? Your move. It's your move. How do you go out there with your bread and butter move and get put on your back and jump up and go, I'm okay? You know, that that takes some right there. I kid you not. I mean, there's a lot of guys right there just said, I just gave this guy my best shot and he put me on my back. No, and not Mark. He just said, you know, well, I'm going to keep at it. And he did. And he did. And, you know, I'm not saying that he broke Ed because Ed was a great champion. But yeah. there comes a time where the control breaks and Mark broke control to where he was in control. And that's when it all changed. And, no. you know, you're fighting a guy off and you're fighting a guy off and you're fighting a guy off. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard on you. You know, I was talking with Josh Heupel, who used to be a quarterback at OU, and we were talking, and I said, you know, I said, I was never the greatest athlete. And there's lots of times out there, especially in the world tournament, you're out there just going 90 miles an hour, and sometimes you want to go, oh, man, I don't know if I can do this again. And I always tell myself, okay, if you just if you just give it 100% one more time, if you don't want to do it, that's okay. And I just kept telling myself, one more time, one more time, one more time. And Josh said the same thing. He goes, yeah, I get hit sometimes Say, I'm not taking another one like that. And I'd get up and shake it off and go, okay, I'll, I'll take one more, and then I'm going to make a decision if I want to keep doing it. And I think that, you know, Mark just kept focused on that one more time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep keep this up until I get what I want. Yeah, Mark and, had a perfect senior season, 27-0. His yep. brother Dave, um, junior year, he shows up with you guys in 1981. He's 26 and one. He took second place to Ricky Stewart. Yep. Crazy match. Ricky caught him with kind of, I don't know what you call it, cow catcher or whatever, and just turned him. And everybody was surprised. And uh, even Dave was surprised. But, you know, Dave come off and he was a little upset, of course, but he was a typical Dave. Just like 10 minutes later, life was normal. You know, and Mark wasn't like that. Mark was like me. He took losses personally and, and they sat deep. They set real deep. And same Andre's losses set deep with him, too. Is I think anybody that when you devote all your time and your energy into something and, you know, it's a 24-7 deal for you, that when you don't get the results that, that you're hoping for, 
it, it's a disappointment and, and, and it digs you for sure. Wow. Wow. So 1982, his senior, Dave's senior year at Oklahoma, he's 33 and three. He takes first place. The guy that he transferred from the college from, Mike Sheets, is in the finals. It's literally a storybook type type finish there. What was what was like Dave's mental clarity or where was he at going into that fight, that that match? Oh, as I recall it, I think I think Dave was just Dave, you know. I think, you know, like I said, Dave was an unbelievable student of the sport and he knew everybody that he was going to compete against. So I don't think there was any unknowns about what Dave was going to expect in the match. It was just whether he was going to be able to execute. And Mike Sheets was a great champion. He was a very hard to wrestle because he was a little bit unorthodox. And people would put themselves in bad positions thinking that they were okay, and they weren't. And Mike Sheets was an unbelievable rider. And, uh, you know, and, and, and a great student himself. You know, he's, he's a doctor now and uh, still lives here in Oklahoma. But, you know, Mike... Mike really surprised a lot of people, even on the international circuit. People thought of him as a collegiate style ground rush of the whole deal. And, and he had some international success as well. But I think the match pretty much came down to maybe what Dave thought it was going to be from his past encounters with Mike. I think that it was a match that Dave said, when, it, when the time runs out, I got to be ahead. And I think that's pretty much what it was. And Dave worked hard in that match. I mean, it wasn't yeah. something that was done by trickery or anything else. I mean, that was one of those grinder matches where Dave had to slug it out to win. And, and he showed that he could, that he could be in the fight either way. He could out technique you or he could battle you. Yeah, D Dave and Mike Sheets were just the ultimate competitors and they were always neck and neck. Yeah. Mark, on the other hand, when he went to battle Sheets, Mark, Mark made Sheets pay. Oh yeah. Mark yeah. hurt Sheets. Mark yeah. was so much physical. And like I said, Mark had, Mark had. He made Sheets quit. Yeah. He, Mark had such an awareness of his body. And it's like I talk about Mark hitting the inside trip and getting put on his back. He took Mike Sheets' strong points away from him to where you got to question yourself. Well, I just gave him my best shot. What do I do now? And yes. I think that, that happens a lot. In yeah, Mark made Sheets quit. It was just incredible. incredible. Not even, you know, I don't want to say that Mike wasn't in the match because he's a great champion. But ever so often you run into a guy. Yeah, bad matchup. He's, he's just not your guy. Yeah, you know, it's a bad matchup. That's yeah, all. a bad yeah. matchup. Yeah, I mean, everybody's got it. You know, Hank Aaron couldn't hit off certain pitchers. Yeah. It is what it is. Um, UFC 5, Dan Sever. His corner's walking in with your shirts on, the Trip Academy shirts. That's actually my cousin's training center. Okay, People, so it's not your training center. Oh, my cousin Mark had a training center in the Detroit area. And then... And then not not uh, from ridicule, but we laugh about, you know, the shirts, how primitive they were and the whole deal. But, um, you know, Dan was from the Flint area. He was from Montrose Hill McCl McCloy up by, by Flint. And uh, he was training at my cousin's academy because uh, he was back in the state. And, you know, MMA was just developing. And my cousin Mark had a facility. And uh, Dan had been training there. And basically uh that's that's how that evolved and people asked me said oh yeah i saw where you and dan were training together and i said no no we didn't train together i was already in oklahoma and i said that was my cousin's uh, facility there and i've been in ferndale yeah we've got a a couple psychotic people that also track mixed martial arts the way we do cosmo delosi he's the one that's like oh dude look at the t-shirts you know Severn wasn't wearing it you know i'm on my phone i'm just looking at oh yeah it kind of does say trip academy <laughs> yeah. so yeah <laughs> That's from him. What about Mark Densberger? Did you ever roll with him? No, Mark was on the team with us, but he never he never worked out with me. And he was the weight class below me. And, you know, Clinton Burke was my training partner. And Clinton was an unbelievable athlete. He was a NCAA runner up here at Oklahoma when Mark and Dave were here at 134. He was a silver medalist in the World Greco and World Freestyle as a junior. And then he was a four-time world silver medalist in the Sambo at four different weights. And for a guy that walked around at about 150 pounds, I'm telling you, the guy was a monster. And so, you know, we trained together here in Oklahoma. And so when we went to the Worlds, there's not a lot of training going on other than, you know, you're just moving around with your guys. Or if you go and train with one of the guys in the other country, everybody knows you're not there to kill each other before the tournament. And if someone kind of revs it up, you just walk off. But no, Mark, uh, 
you know, he had the PA guys, Dane DeRose and some guys and kind of stuck to himself. And uh, I knew Mark from the teams and from the Nationals. Some teams he made, some that he didn't. But um, it never, never worked out with him very much. I may have, may have grabbed him one time uh, uh, standing in, in one of the warm-ups. How was he socially? Different guy. You know. <laughs> he's, he's getting out of jail soon. I, I knew that's where you're going with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All those things that uh, after the fact, you look at him and you went, okay. Because his his uh, team, his student team, had a different perception of how you conduct yourself with a coach. You know, it was always grandmaster. They referred to him as grandmaster, and they referred to him as, uh, well, you know, the grandmaster is coming down next week to teach our classes. And it was kind of like when you talk about those guys that go, oh, yeah, I got my Olympic trophy at home. And, you know, no one calls my coach or his grandmaster. You know, at the death touch, right? Yeah, right. The death, two days from now, you're going to fall over and be quivering. But no, I mean, you know, Mark, he had some submissions and and uh, and he won some championships. I don't know if he ever placed in the worlds or not. But um, uh, most of the guys on the Sambo team, with the exception of Steve Smith and Steve Nelson, uh, Sam Allen was a good guy. Sam was a guy that trained hard. Um, that was pretty much it. I didn't work out with a lot of the guys during the world tournament because, you know, we flew in. And you're there five days and you fly out. What about Richard Hamilton? I don't remember Richard. So Richard was a Sambo guy that was another Severn coach that also went on to coach Mark Coleman. I think it was like Phoenix, Phoenix okay. Academy was him. He was in a witness protection program. Okay. And eventually the FBI came, questioned Mark Coleman. Is this guy been around children and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, this guy's got a different name, and he's, he's yeah. left to see. I don't think again. I, I know Mark. Mark and I know each other. And um, uh, once in a while, we communicate. But I didn't, I didn't know any of the guys that were in his corner out of his Hammer House gym. He had um, – I forgot his name. He had a big heavyweight that was about six foot six, maybe Wes Sims. Six ten, yeah. Wes Sims, yeah. I think Wes had uh, – we talked with Wes sometimes and maybe used him in, in, in our fight program. But um, I knew Mark primarily as a wrestler. And then, you know, through Dan, the kind of little Michigan-Ohio circle that we have there. Yeah. And that was a... Now, you, you so... mentioned Steve Nelson in there. And, you know, Steve went on to be an MMA pioneer as well. We interviewed him. And, and uh, he tells a story about how you, uh, you know, were a mentor to him. I, I think it was the judo championship or national championships. And he didn't have the money for a plane ticket. And I, I think you, you kind of told him, hey, don't worry about it. I got you and, 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 and took him there. He also, you know, credited you as somebody who's probably done that a few times in his career. So why, why don't you talk a little bit about Steve Nelson? Uh, you can't get You know, Steve is, is as much as I tease, tease Steve, he is really humble about uh, what he's brought to the table, not just for MMA, but for wrestling. You know, it's my personal opinion that Texas girls wrestling is where it is today because of Steve Nelson. And he really, I remember when he started to run with that, I was like, man, I don't know, Steve, that's going to be hard to push. And, you know, he goes, no, he said, we're starting to get some things going. And he did. He had that little Maverick wrestling club out there that uh, brought kids to any kind of tournament as there was. And, you know, when he was at Palo Duro High School, uh, you know, we had Joe Stafford out there who became an NCAA champ for Oklahoma. I think Brandon Slade was from out that area, if I'm not mistaken, or maybe it was one of the other kids. But, um, uh, They've had a couple guys come out of there, but Steve has a heart as, as, as big as the moon. I'm not kidding you. And, you know, he, he came and lived with me and trained with me. And, you know, he was from Oklahoma State. And people said, you got that guy at your house? And I go, yeah, he's my friend. And he trained hard. And, you know, to be on to be on my on my list, all you have to do is be a stand-up guy, do the right thing when nobody's looking, and train your butt off. And I don't care if you win or lose. I just want you to slap the guy's hand and say, let's see what you got today. And that's that's what it's about. And everybody I've coached, everybody I've trained with, that's kind of been my philosophy is um, winning will take care of itself. Losing will take care of itself. If you prepare yourself properly and surround yourself with good people and you're the right mindset and that match starts, then most of the time you're going to be okay. And yeah. that's what, kind of what Steve bought into as well. And he's been a great friend over the years. And uh, we still stay in contact. And then I, I wish it was a little closer than five, five hours or I'd probably see him probably twice a month. He's underappreciated, in my opinion, in terms of combat sports. 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He's, you know, he was, um, you know, he pushed for, uh, countless sambo girls wrestling, judo, you know, open wrestling, you know, we're talking about Texas. I mean, we are talking about Texas, America in 1980 and he has up going to Oklahoma state. You know, that's like a guy from the moon showing up at Penn state on the wrestling mat. And I know we had a kid named David Flores. We recruited out of Houston. And I don't know if it was before or after Steve went to Oklahoma state, but Steve wrestled some matches for Oklahoma state. And I tell people all the time, I said, look, I said, you know, uh, one of my young men that I coach was an NCAA qualifier this year and was pointed that he didn't make all American. And I said, you know, with the pandemic and the extended eligibility, about 1600 guys this year wanted to be on a division one team. And I said, some of them made it. I said, out of all of them, 32 qualified for this tournament. You're one of them and you want a match. I said, there's only two things left, all American and national champ. And I said, at the end of the day, only one guy goes home happy. And that's the guy that wins it. And I said, look at your blessings. And Steve, the same one I told Steve, look at the great career that you had, despite never being an NCAA champion. How many guys in that time frame, not just come out of Texas, but had the support to have ability to have the skill level to go to a school like Oklahoma State University. You're talking about one back then, one of the top four, top six schools in the country. You know, it's not like he's going to some place where they're starting the program. And they got a guy that wrestled a year at high school. No, he was in the heat with those guys. He was in there with some great wrestlers. No, he's a, he's, he's a good friend and, and he is definitely a great ambassador for combative sports. Now his USWF was historical in terms of MMA and, and what was Pancrase rules in Texas in the nineties. So yep. he was at, at the very forefront of that. His rival, we with uh, Ralph Gracie, you know, he fought him twice, you know, once on a pay-per-view. So uh, Steve definitely is a guy that th is a pioneer in MMA. Um, also, interestingly, in terms of uh, memorabilia and stuff, did, Steve was a little marketing machine with that USWF because he sold DVDs and shirts and stuff like that. And uh, one of the DVDs, I believe for USWF1, came with a bonus DVD that yes, actually had a judo match with Ron Tripp facing off against uh, Robert LaForge or something along those lines. And I may not have his name right, but you did a, a, a judo match in the USWF ring for Steve Nelson at his first show. Is that correct? Why don't you tell us about that whole story and how that came through? Oh, you know, and this is where I could kick his butt. You know, you talk about Dan Severn and I used to laugh about not making any money. So anyways, Steve calls me and he goes, hey, I need you to come out and be on this event for me. I'm like, what are you talking about? And it, this is like in July or June. And, you know, it's, it's this isn't like Detroit. It's a little warm down here in June in Oklahoma and Texas. And I said, when? And he goes, like, August 14th. And I said, oh, man, I don't want to do this. He goes, come on, man. It, just, it really helped me out a lot. So I agreed to us. So what do you want me to do? And he goes, well, I want you to fight basically an MMA match in a, in a cage. But if you want, um, you can do it with a gi on. And I said, all right. I said, well, either a sambo jacket or, or a karate jacket or a, a judo uniform. I don't care. I said, but um, I said, you know, for me coming from as a kid, I came from a boxing background with my dad. Then into a karate background and then into wrestling and then into judo and then into sambo. So I felt that my grappling was probably something I need to make sure that if I had a chance at any advantage, at least I get a hold of somebody because you know, I'm old at the time. I can't remember how old I was, 40, 41, I guess, 42. And uh, so I agreed to it and uh, Robbie uh, agreed to the, to the match. And I knew Robbie, he was a good, a good competitor. He was a multidisciplinary guy that had done a lot of different sports. And, um, and he said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. And we had a pretty tough uh, match. I mean, it was, it was, I think it was basically, there was no really, not any, any rules, but both of us had come from a, a jacket background as well as a wrestling background. And so, I mean, we threw some knees and threw some elbows and stuff. But, you know, when, when, the, when the tensity or the, when you're anxious and the tension's on, the heat's on, you go to your bread and butter. And I think that's how the match progressed in that manner. Um, if, you know, if he'd been a boxer, it certainly would have gone, in a different direction but i think i think it was a good match uh, for the event and um you know steve i don't i don't think he actually 
gave me the money he promised. And now we paid for the hotel room. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. And that's I cool. We, I think we went to a Hooters to eat after it was over. And then uh, I think we went to Lake Meredith for a picnic on Sunday and went home. I don't you think said I ever, you a bill for the food after that? No, 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 no. He paid for the okay. food. I don't think okay. I ever got the $300. You know? And of course, okay. you know, like what I joke about all the time is they talk about guys, uh, uh, wrestlers going into MMA. And I say, you know, the the the, the, the skit joke about the thing is you go, all right, now let me get this straight. You're going to pay me $300 for about 10 minutes to get in there and beat each other up and headbutt and elbow each other and pick each other up and slam each other to the mat. And they go, yeah, and we're going to pay for your hotel and we're going to feed you. And you're going to get to have a lot of people watch you do it. Okay. You're messing with me, right? You're going to pay me <laughs> With what I do every day in a wrestling room for three hours, I'm going to get paid for what I do every day. I'm in, and and that was really the truth. A lot of us laughed about that. It's like, okay, I've been elbowed in the head, I've been hit in the head, I certainly had my head split open from headbutting each other or catching a knee. And I was, yeah, I'm in, and that really, I think, is what was funny about wrestlers getting involved in MMA originally, was the fact that you know, as I said, there's a certain percent of the population that doesn't need to be provoked. You hooked a guy and said, hey, man, you looking for trouble? Well, geez, I don't know. It might be. You know, what do you want me to, you want me to kick your butt? You look down at your watch and you go, yeah, I got time. I'm good. Let's go. <laughs> you know, I think that's kind of how wrestlers got into MMA. I really do. Yeah. Pride. Let's bring it to 1993, the U.S. Sambo Championships in Norman, Oklahoma, your backyard. Yeah. The uh, legend of, of jiu-jitsu, Hickson Gracie, shows up. Did you know who he was prior to the bout? How does this come together? Walk us through it from the beginning, please. No clue, really. It was uh, it was just kind of weird. I knew, you know, uh, Higgin had come up, and he brought his brothers with him, and he brought some other Brazilian guys. And I think I was fighting 220 that day because I didn't cut to 98. And um, so we're going through the rounds. I fought some guy from Pennsylvania, I think, and I fought a guy from Ohio. And I think I fought one or two other guys, and we're down to, like, either the quarterfinals or – semis that I remember and so Pat comes over and he goes well you know you got one of Higgins guys he's a jujitsu guy and uh, and I'd fought and I'd fought uh, Higgins before so uh, I certainly wasn't going to intentionally take the guy to the mat and do a grappling situation just in case and we're kind of moving around and and he was quite a bit smaller than I was and he just kind of moved slow he wasn't really aggressive or anything and he came inside and tried to get a, a grip I gripped him and just threw the crap out of him. And uh, uh, they, they called a, a full point on it. And that was it. I didn't think anything of it. And I think it was probably not until maybe eight years later, nine years later, people asked me about it. I said, yeah, I threw some guy. And they showed me a picture. And I said, yeah, that was him. <laughs> and they went, oh, yeah, well, he'd never been beaten before. And I went, yeah, okay, whatever. And him and his Olympic trophy, right? Um, and I said, I, I don't know what to tell you about that. So then the thing took off. I think it was 2002 where they a couple of people called me from some of these different companies want me to fight them again and i said all right and they started talking about money and all these things and i said well you know here's the thing i'll, I'll do that and i said but here's here's what the dollar amount is and they're all good with it and they came back and said well they want something else and this and that and i said well no i said listen he needs to beat me i said you know i, I won the match I, I didn't think a big it's not a big deal to me i certainly lost matches and I said, but it is what it is. And I said, you know, it's going to be equal pay for, for the match or, or I'm not interested. I don't need it, you know. And things kind of died down for about, I don't know. What, what kind of pay were they talking, if you don't mind us asking? You know, in today's terms, it was, I'll just say. Five figures probably, or six figures? You, oh, you, it, was, it was six figures, yeah. Oh, okay, good, okay. Yeah, you yeah, know, it wasn't like they were off a grand or anything. No, I mean. It was uh, it it was it was I'll just say it was six figures. I would say it would be uh, an average night for a medium to high profile UFC fighter if he wins. And okay, yeah. but so and, why couldn't the bridge be crossed? Did he want to get paid more than you? Well, I, as I understood it, and um, I don't Hicks and I had never talked since the day that I fought him. Didn't talk today that we fought, and so you know I don't know how deep it was on his end. I knew what these people who were approaching me, what they were talking about. And it was like, it was show and win 
kind of like USD had been. You have so much to fight, so much to win. And they came back and said, well, we need to alter the contract that they want a flat fee. And the flat fee was basically to show and win. I said, no, I'm not doing that. I said, why would I fight for, for show and win when you're flat fee and this guy for the whole person on the other side? I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Mm-hmm. And I said, either you flat fee everybody or you show and win. I don't care. And so that, that kind of died off. And, and, you know, and Hicks may have not had any involvement in it whatsoever. I just know what was presented to me. Um, God, I can't remember the lady's last name, but she called me and called me a couple of times and they were nice. And then the thing came up about my weight because from judo, I was walking around at about 240 and they asked if I could make, uh, I have to make 205. And I said, yeah, I'll make it in two weeks. And I literally uh, had a verified weight and I was 204 and a half in two weeks. And I don't think they were happy about that. I think for what I could tell, they might've been happy. I couldn't make the weights. They could say, oh, he can't make the weight and it's not going to happen. But, you know, you guys are in the business. You hear these things all the time about what someone's going to do. And then, some time went by and a guy from Brazil contacted me and, you know, if we could get you guys together, you know, we're going to do a pay-per-view and world yada, yada, yada. And I said, do this ain't my first rodeo. I said, it's a flat fee and you can do what you want with pay-per-view and everything else out of some state. <laughs> yeah, we got points on a pay-per-view yeah. that no one's going to be able to order. Yeah. yeah. And I said, hey, you know what? Uh, uh, I said, we can do three fights. He can kick my butt the next two. I don't care. As long as I'm getting paid. And, uh, Said, oh, no, no, no. And I said, look, I said, I'm not in into a, a bunch of crazy stuff. I was already on President of USA Judo. I was already on the Olympic Committee. Yeah, there's stuff going on. But, you know, you get those calls all the time. You know, I'll, I'll get a call, I think probably six or seven years ago, I call about somebody saying, hey, if I can put this thing together. And I'm always nice about it. And I go, hey, well, you know, if it happens, let me know. But, you know, you got a lot of people out there that see something and may represent that they're representing me because I've had that happen before or they're representing Hickson. I have no idea, but you know, those are the only two approaches I ever had. And I don't know if his guys were getting anything on the other end, if they were reaching out to me first, but uh, certainly on the first one, there had to be some communication because they were talking about contract terms, but uh, you know, it's, it's a combative sport. It's like wrestling. It's like the guy saying, Oh, I never lost. It's like boxing. Oh, I never lost. Everybody gets beat by. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 Ron, I mean, you guys haven't spoke since, obviously. You know, my next, I guess now, statement was a question. I truly believe that whatever took place that day just changed his mindset. Like, there's, he, he's got a documentary called Choke, where he's talking about dealing with his pre-fight anxiety, and it's like out, like out of control anxiety. And um, he's, ref- you know, called out Sakuraba, called out Mark Coleman, you know, several other people, and he was the one calling them out and then not able to, Mark Kerr, another example, not able to kind of connect all the dots or have the dots connect in order to make that meeting happen. Granted, there's a little bit of tragedy in there. I don't want to discredit that as well. Yeah, you know, I'm telling you, there's there's, there's a few guys out there that you have to have something wrong with you (laughs) to want to get in the cage with them, you know. Uh, Mark Kerr is a, a great friend, and if I had to fight Mark, I would. Not something I would look forward to. Dan yeah, Seven, not by choice, right? Yeah, right. Uh, you know he's a Toledo kid, and uh, these are Michigan Ohio guys go back and forth. You know, Mark Coleman again. Um, if if it came to it, and I had to, okay. Uh, Dan Seven, I don't think Dan and I could fight. We were just we've become too good of friends, you know. And and I'm almost there with Mark Kerr, um, another guy I'm there with that. It, you know, especially at my age, I would not fight as did Brandon Vera. Brandon and I, from Coach Jody Eddie Stevens and Brandon and I became friends. And we were walking back in Los Angeles to the hotel one night, and I'm looking at this guy, and he's fighting 205, which was about the weight I was fighting. And I just told him, I said, you know, if I had to, I guess I'd have to. But I just want you to know, I look at you and say to myself, I'm not really interested in messing with this guy. <laughs> he's, got, he's got a foot about the size of a boat oar, you know. And he's just, you know, his, I don't like to be kicked. And to think about him kicking me because I've seen him kick, I was like, no, I'm, I'm not in for that. I'm not in for that. And uh, there's a few guys out there. You know, I'm, I'm more apt to go after a heavyweight uh, than I would be after Brandon Vera. Because I'm telling you, the guy, he is a monster. And just a great guy. Absolutely great guy, for sure. Yeah, he's, he's on our short list of interviews. We're actually planning on reaching out to him in the next couple of weeks about getting him to sit down just like much like you are right now. 
Um, you spend a little time in Japan. You know, I, I know we got a little time in Japan, but before we get to Japan, Joe Daddy, Stevenson, Melvin Gillard, um, you've cornered both of them in the UFC. How does your relationship come together with them? Well, you know, I started a company called C3 Fights and uh, partnered with uh, Howard Pollock from uh, Oklahoma, who was a New York concert promoter. And I was originally going to start the fight company and just roll with it. And uh, Howard said, well, you know, I do concerts. I can bring concerts out production to the to the events. And long story short, it ran and it blew up and it was great. And we were doing shows in Carroll, Oklahoma and, and uh, Texas and just uh, Louisiana, partnered with Bellator on some fights. I actually did their their fight format and they labeled the broadcast uh, as a Bellator fight. But um, Joe Daddy came out as a guest for one of our VIP guests for one of our fights and started talking to me about his uh, wrestling and judo career. And he had some struggles on getting his rank certified. And so we were talking about, you know, what he'd done. And so I said, well, you know, if, if, if you're black belt quality, I'll, I'll sign off on you. I'm president of USA judo. And so Joe's ability and his technical ability was through the roof. And so I promoted him to, uh, to black belt prior to that. He said, Hey, would you consider being one of my coaches? And I said, well, you know, Joe, I'm, I'm tied up with a lot of things, but yeah, uh, we had a bond and we connected and then I was, I was all in and I said, whatever you need me to do, I'll make myself available. And so it kind of ran from there. And uh, I was working with Joe and Melvin came out to fight uh, Diaz in the Oklahoma City UFC. Didn't know Melvin from anybody. And Joe calls me and goes, hey, we got one of my really good friends from, from the Ultimate Fighter coming out here. Could you kind of big brother him and take care of him while he's there? And I said, yeah. And I said, well, I haven't called you. So Melvin calls me and they're downtown at the, uh, I can't remember what hotel, but I go down and pick him up. I take him to dinner up at Tokyo Japanese restaurant. And, and he's just a real personal, as you know, real, you know, outgoing kid. Real he's person. nuts. Yeah. You know, he is, you know, yeah. and, and he's he that ground from wrestling and the, the challenges with his family about, you know, his father not being a factor and his mother having dependency issues and how he'd been fighting since he was 16. He would fight, on a Friday in Louisiana and go fight in Georgia on Saturday just to make money at 16 years old. And, uh, and, you know, so I kind of, you know, bought into him and, and had, had a soft spot for him. Well, he fights Diaz and he goes out there, man. And he's like, he's going off like, you know, a world champion and then just fades, bang, he ends up getting choked out. So we go back to the hotel and I'm getting ready to tell him goodbye. And, uh, all these guys are like, oh, you know, you just got caught. And I'm like, what? And uh, he said, what do you think? I said, you look like crap. And I said, you just stuck your neck out because you didn't want to get hit anymore. He goes, no, I didn't. I said, well, regardless whether you didn't test it or not, I said, you're better than that guy. I said, you should have been in shape. But so anyways, uh, that's it. Boom. I take off. I come back to Norman, Oklahoma, about 20 miles away. And Joe calls me. And he goes, hey. I think Melvin's going to ask you to coach him. I said, yeah, I don't think so. You, may, you must not be up to date on the last conversation we had because I wasn't very complimentary of him. He goes, no, he, he says that's what he needs. And I said, well, he needs to come see me. He can't just call me. So Melvin shows up in my office, and I got people all over the place. I'm like, what are you doing here? He goes, well, Joe said I need to come and talk to you. Said, yeah, you need to make arrangements to come when I'm able to talk to you. So I sent him out, and he went and got a hotel. So he comes back the next morning to make arrangements. So he comes back next morning. Well, I'm not in the office on Tuesday morning. He comes in. He's the only guy in the place. He thinks he scored back to the hotel. So Wednesday morning, he comes over and I sit down with him just real quickly. I just said, you know, Melvin, uh, you know, here's the thing. I said, I don't need to coach you. I said, I got seven world medals on my uh, trophy case at home. I got dozens of national and Pan Am medals. And I said, I've already coached in the UFC with Joe Stevenson. I said, my life is not going to be defined by coaching you. And I said, but let me tell you what, and I, I said, you know, American politicians don't run this office. I said, Russians run this office. This is my office. I'm, you know, there's, there's no voting. There's no voting. There's my way or the highway, and I don't care. And I said, you know, first of all, if you're going to come here, I said, you're going to get rid of all this, all this gangster look type thing that you got going on as far as the change and all that noise. And I said, what we're going to do is uh, you're going to conduct yourself like a businessman. I said, I'm going to introduce some Heisman Trophy winners, professional football players, professionals in the town. One day a week, you're going to go golfing in the morning with these guys. And you're going to pick their brain and learn about their success traits. I said, you're going to start wearing a suit to UFC if I coach you. And I said, um, 
Last but not least, I'm not here to get oh. you in shape. If you show up ready to train, I'm not your cardio coach. And he goes, well, okay, I'll agree to that. And he goes, so how much? And I said, how much what? And he goes, like, what, 10%, 15%? I said, no. He goes, 20%? I said, no. And he goes, coach, 25% is a lot of a person. I said, I don't want your money. I said, hopefully you're going to be a smart guy, Melvin. And one day you'll be on this side of the desk. And I said, all you owe me is to treat that kid sitting in that chair you're in as well as I treated you. Not any better. That's all you owe me. And I said, you pay my travel to get there and you pay my room. I said, I don't room with other people, but I'm going to eat no matter if I'm in Norman, Oklahoma, or if I'm in Las Vegas, Nevada. And I said, you get me to the event and you give me a place to sleep. And that's all you owe me. And same way with Joe. That's all I ever was. Never took a dime from a fight purse. And um, hopefully, and I know Joe's done that. And Melvin, I believe, has tried to do that as well, is that you start paying it back and help some other kid down the line, you know. I had well, people there. We just had Melvin on, and um, he's not the same human being. Like, he's absolutely matured. And little life lessons like that may not have, you might not have seen a, a, a tree blossom at that moment, but you certainly planted some seeds because well, yeah, the way I, you, I saw the change in him when he was here. I mean, yeah. you know, I had, had a very close friend of mine, Evan Milstead, who we got Melvin an apartment, temporary apartment, a couple of doors down from Evan intentionally. I said, keep an eye on him. And so he did. And, you know, Melvin started to understand, uh, you know, things about business. He started to understand things about being responsible and being accountable for things. And, and, you know, I think there was a big change when he, when he moved to Florida, you know, when, when he was here, probably a little bit more accountable than, than he wanted to be, but, you know, we knocked out Evan Dunham. We knocked out Roller. We knocked out Ronnie Torres. Uh, we had Jim Miller in trouble. And in fact, Jim, Jimmy still says, I don't even know how I choked Melvin. He goes, I was unconscious. And even Donnie Cerrone, we took that fight on short notice because no one would fight Don. And Melvin goes, that's not right, man. He's my teammate. It's in his town. He goes, I'm going to take the fight. And, you know, even Donnie goes, man, I don't think I've been hit that hard in my life. Melvin can, Melvin can change your life if he, I promise you. And he yeah. is an unbelievable athlete. His footwork and like he, he, he does almost like a triangle, like I, I'm going to call it a dance. And what it does is it like it moves forward and then he lures you in to his space. And by the time you're there, he's, he's already got it just cock loaded and all he's got to do is explode. Well, I'll, take a little, I'll take a little bit of credit for that, Mike. When he came here, yeah. he was he's a heavy punch. So I made him do these, we call them slides around the mat to where you yeah. have to move really, really hard on the inside of your legs. But what it does, it makes you real light on your feet. And then the other thing that we, we focused on, which is a little bit of a trade, and I guess since I'm not coaching anymore, it's not a big deal, but I've always said, Melvin, when we engage a guy, the first thing we do is we move to our left. And what's, and what's he going to do? He's going to follow us. And when he follows us, light him up. And basically, he, he'll come out, slide, move. And when he slides to that position, and the guy comes to engage him, because they all do it. No one just stands there and waits for him to come back. No, it's a trap. Yeah. You slide to your left, yeah. and come, it's a trap. Eddie, yeah. Alvarez, Eddie Alvarez, I was in uh, Florida one time and showing that to Eddie. He goes, that's the craziest thing in the world, man. And I said, the uppercut and the overhands are all day long. They will follow you. And you're just waiting for them to get into that little box to, to, to tag them. Yeah. So, yeah, Melvin's a smart fighter. He's a very smart fighter. He's a smart kid. He, he's That's the kind of, I don't know, zone in his radio a little bit tighter. On the yeah, he's his own worst enemy. That's for sure. Yeah. That's for sure. Well, why don't we close with Japan? Obviously, we've had you almost an hour and a half right now. You trained under world judo champion Chonosuke Takagi. Yep. Legend within the sport of judo. Yeah, that, uh, you know, my buddy Mike Swain, who's a champion, is the one that made that possible. My coach, Pat Burris, had always told me it's important to go to Japan. Oddly enough, um, uh, Pat said, you know, most guys go before they get a world medal in the sport. And he goes, you're going after. I already been on the world judo team as well. But Mike was going to Japan, and we were going to train for the 92 Olympic Games uh, for the trials. And Pat had trained, as I said, he trained under Okano. And uh, uh, so he said, you know, Mike's going to go to Nichida. You should try to go. So, okay. So Mike and myself and Jimmy Pedro went together the first time, and Jimmy was the world champion as well. Jimmy was about 18. Mike was about 28. Wow. And I was about 38. So I was. 
And uh, Takagi Sensei, he was just an unbelievable guy. Um, you know, just a lot like Stan Abel and a lot like Pat Burris. He was serious. But he, he thought that Nichidai Nihon Judo should be a place to draw players from around the world so that his students in the, in the, on the judo team could, could experience different techniques. And Nietzsche Dice had some great champions. He was a great champion. And, you know, uh, he passed away a few years ago and broke my heart. I was in tears for, for at least two days. And, you know, he wasn't just my coach. He was my friend. And j just, just as Pat Burris is. And, you know, Pat and Takagi competed about the same time. So I had these guys out of the same mental area, era of competition. And, you know, it just, uh, he was a, a very impacting soul. The door was always open. And... He always waited for you to ask for help unless he saw something that needed to be corrected. Then he would come in and say, this is what we're going to do. But, you know, half of it, again, kind of like when I told Melvin, I'll open the door. You pay it forward. You know, Takagi opened the door and said, you're welcome here anytime you want to come. And I literally could get on a plane, if you know, relatively in retrospect, get on a plane today with nothing but a couple pieces of clothes and go to, go to Nietzsche and everything was taken care of for as long as I wanted to stay. Wow. And that was a huge gift. And the friendships I made with uh, Makoto Takimoto, uh, Michiaki Komochi, Jun Kono, uh, guys that went on to be all Japan champions, guys that to be uh, Olympians, collegiate world champions, Olympic champions. You know, it just, um, it, it was a life-changing experience. And, you know, but looking back all the way back to Andre Mesker, if I wouldn't have come to Oklahoma, I wouldn't have started judo, I wouldn't have met Pat Burris, none of those things would have happened in my life. And so I go back again and thank Andre and Stan, Andre for the invitation and Stan for making it interesting enough and, and attractive enough for me to want to stay here. And, and both those guys, as well as uh, Pat Burris, I mean, the, the debt I owe them is, is unpayable. My life is different because of those guys. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, since we're talking a little bit about Japan, you know, we're, we're very enamored with the culture and we love you know stories like that one of the things you hear is that you know judo boxing mma they're all very siloed very isolated uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned takimoto and he did cross over to do pride fights and things like that uh, are you able to share with us any of the politics he went through to, to get that permission uh, you know because uh, those types of things interest us well actually with takagi the only thing he didn't like was pro wrestling and you could end up on the bad list. And I forget who was wrestling, but Kono told me that one of the guys from Nichidai entered a pro wrestling deal and he didn't tell Sakagi about it. Of course, Sakagi was Kono's coach also. And he told me the whole trip's on Mondai and big problem. He said, taking somebody to pro wrestling, they call it pro -res. And he goes, uh, uh, and then he, uh, he called him Chosan. Takagi says, Chosan, oh, he's angry. <laughs> and he didn't see him until he was on TV. And so he was madder than hell, which was funny. But yeah, you know, Takimoto was an unbelievable talent. Again, he was kind of like a Mark Schultz of Japan. He could throw anybody, and I mean anybody, in Japan. His hip strength was unbelievable. And Kono said to me before the Olympics, he goes, I'm hoping Taki does okay at the Olympics. He goes, uh, all of Taki's matches are a four poem, which means a total victory. He goes, but not always for Taki. So he, either he's throwing you or you're throwing him. There's not going to be any decisions for <laughs> And Takimoto went on to, of course, to be Olympic champion, which, which is great. But, um, yeah, it is an isolated thing. I thought that when I got there, and I know you guys are running out of time, so I'll be quick, but I thought when I got to Nichidai that I would see the Taj Mahal setting off in this field, and it would be like the campus of Notre Dame, and there would be the judo building. And, in fact, it was a four-story building behind the Denny's restaurant in uh, – Eko to Japan and you walk in and there's a place to leave your shoes and straight ahead is the training floor. And the next three floors are kitchen, bathrooms and dormitories. And you're literally a, a building off the street in Ikoda, yeah. down on And uh, uh, so that part was a shock. And then uh, the old thing used to be, well, you know, if you win the all Japan championships, you're an automatic millionaire. Well, I told Kono that and he started laughing and he said, trips on, please go get my money. <laughs> no, there's no million dollars. It's just a pride of being the best in Japan. But that tournament is a badass tournament. They start out with city champions that come down to like a prefecture or state thing. 
And the top 32 guys in the country meet on one day and they fight to see who the number one guy is. Now that is a badass tournament, guys. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but when it starts from farm fields in Kyoto to to Tokyo, and, uh, and ends there with being the best guy. And Kono was in it ten times, four time finalist, two time champion, and you know what a great honor. But you know, people tell me, so you're going over to beat up those little Japanese guys, huh? And I said, well, you know, if you can find some for me, because where I train at, everybody is my size or bigger, and of those guys. I can only beat half of them half the time. And of that half, I can only beat half of those guys half the time. So one day I get these guys, next day I get these guys, then it switches, they get me. And they said, what about the, the, you know, of these world medals and this and that? And I said, they can only send one to the world championships. That's the guy I got to focus on. I just got to beat one of them. I don't got to beat them all. But, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like our wrestling or like our boxing. They are so deep. The Russians the same way. Guy who's number 10 in Russia could easily be Olympic champion. It's just, that's just, that's how close it is with those guys. But a wonderful experience in my life, wonderful people. Um, everything that you hear about respect and honor and treating you well. I saw, I had nothing but a, but a positive experience about the Japanese and, you know, considered a second home when it comes to, to athletics for myself. And that was, that was another bucket list thing in my life that really, I never imagined in my life would ever have a chance to go there and, and compete with those level of people with, you know, Olympic champions, world champions, and, and just uh, enjoy that atmosphere and that culture. It was, it was amazing. That's excellent. Ron, you are a legend within the sport. We sincerely appreciate your time. Oh, I appreciate you guys. I'm humbled to have the opportunity to even be considered uh, for your program. I'm familiar with you guys, and I mean, so many legends and so many guys that I look at with such admiration and, and admire you guys in, in your media work. I mean, someone has to get out there and ring the doorbell to tell the story, and I sincerely want to thank you guys for all the guys that you put on to people can hear the behind-the-stage story of of really what runs their their clock and what got them where they are. And, you know, if there's anything I can ever do, please give me a shout back. And, again, thank you so much. I'm, I'm truly humbled. By Always a pleasure. Thank you, definitely, sir. Definitely. Take care. Thank you very much. Well, Mike, Ron Tripp is in the books, and uh, I think we did historic work today. Yeah, no, we did, for sure. And, I mean, this is kind of a little selfish on my end. One, guy's an absolute pioneer. I got more Schultz questions you know, answered, which is super important to me, especially on the administrative side. Um, I've been studying Mark and Dave like, like a madman. And like more so than I should probably admit, truth be told. So, and I'm a big fan of those two. And too bad you can't write or uh, you could do a book, but you can't write. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you I know, got crayons. You know, I, I can write. <laughs> it, it, it's a fascinating subject. And so I, I'm right there with you. I think it's very interesting. I think, you know, Ron is a guy that has been around since the very beginning. And you can tell that in the conversation. I think. You know, this may really be for a hardcore group within the hardcore group of our fans. You know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I I think that a lot of the names he dropped, a lot of the things there, it, it's for the wrestlers and then for the early bird guys in the early MMA days that like that stuff, they'll remember it. Obviously, the Hicks and Gracie match, when it happened, he's telling you the story that they offer uh, an offer of a rematch and stuff, you know. Just a historic character, and and yeah, I, I, I and, and I knew that uh, would make an interesting interview because I'd been exposed to him before, as I said, and he was a guy who, when he would, you know, type on a message board, would spend the time to give an elaborate response, you know, coherent, detailed, good spelling, you know, all the little you know, checking those little boxes. So I knew, I knew we were going to get a real treat, and, that, and uh, he delivered. You know, here, here, this is what we didn't get to. The Olympics, the politics of them, the interweavings of them, that alone could be a 90-minute interview, you know, especially when, you know, Chicago lost out to the Olympics to Rio. Rio, like, really took a bad hit um, PR-wise, like, internationally in regards to what took place there. But here in Chicago, we had several politically very connected people either jump in front of a train, off a bridge, out of a building. 
um, when all those money deals that were set up fell apart. So that that alone is uh, something that we we could visit in the future. Truth be told, yeah, and, and yeah, I I think you know to be honest with you, I'm not done with Hickson really. You know, I I, I would have liked to have followed up the flow of the interview didn't let me get in there, but I, I would have liked to have followed up. You know, the bottom line is is Hickson's always denied that loss. It's a loss that he says he's protested, et cetera, et cetera. How does that sit with Mark? Because I think, yeah, and I think that we can. With Ron, how's it sit with Ron? Uh, I'm sorry, Ron. Mark is his yeah. brother, but with Ron, uh, because I think we can extrapolate what the answer might be. I, I think he's going to be very unimpressed with that <laughs> that kind of attitude. But um, but I, I would have liked to have heard it from the horse's mouth because Hickson has yeah. continued to be undefeated, you know, in, in his own advertising and things like that. And it is sort of, you know, it comes with an asterisk or whatever you want to call it, but it is something that, you know, the truth is being denied. Well, he also denied knowing the rules, even though he was a like a two-time champion. Like, it's it's kind of, it's on Ron's Wikipedia page. Um, you know, hopefully, here's the other part of it, in the details of it. My understanding of the match is that in Sambo, and this is where the nuances of the rules, where you can sort of see Hickson's point, but what, what Ron did is he's bigger, and he executed a throw... A throw. That yeah, and Uchimata. Well, so what happens though in Sambo is that the, that's enough. That level of dominance in that throw is enough to call the match right away. Yes, that's it. it's, it's complete victory, is what, it, so, what it's called. So <clears throat> Hickson may have thought, you know, on the ground, okay, now I got to make up points for the takedown, and he didn't get a chance. So I could see there may be being some confusion, but at the end of the day. Like I said, the guy continues to, you know, tell well, an undefeated record. And, and it, it, this is where I'm at. I mean, just full disclosure. Henzo Gracie's my favorite Gracie, like for sure, outside of, you know, across and the city. <laughs> Hoist, Helson, Hodger, Hyen, dude, those guys, I could do entire episodes kissing their butts. Hickson, I just can't do it. Like, jiu-jitsu-wise, in the gym-wise, all of that undisputed. But to pretend that that jiu-jitsu re record comes out of the gym and applies to the real world of mixed martial arts, well, there's like a dozen, I got a list of a dozen people that he's called out that uh, even Mark Curran, our last interview with him and, and Coleman, yeah, but he's not serious. Bob Meyerowitz, yeah, he's not serious. Like the people that were on the other side of the call out or, or the person sitting at the desk to sign, put their name on the paperwork in order to make that fight happen. All of them said he was wasting their time. So the people that are constantly going, well, I've never rolled with them. I've never really seen him with it, seen him roll other than like a couple of YouTube videos, but he's for sure could beat everybody because he says so. Well, you know, my parents told me Santa Claus existed when I was a kid. I just, yeah, I, I, and I understand. I, I can't, I, I can't see make that, that, that leap. And, and 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 keep in mind, he would twist my head off with within oh, like but, two but, seconds. But you know, what I, if, I don't deny that. But what if the person telling you how fantastic and unbeatable he is were, say, Carlson Gracie? Someone you do respect. I, then, then, I don't, and, and, no. and then add to that the entire list of the of jujitsu, jujitsu's everybody in jujitsu, Murillo Bustamante, believe, a UFC champion. Those wait, guys, wait, when I they believe, tell us that. Hold up. I believe all of them in jujitsu. But look at Marcelo Great Garcia. He didn't cross over to MMA really well. No, there's been a lot of them, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with the And mindset. I think that's where Hickson may or may not fall, but we'll never know because he called people out and never answered the door when they rang the doorbell. That's was, my issue. Uh, no, 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 I, I understand. I understand. I just, I, I think that he's one of those guys that it's going to be impossible to really answer the question unless we had seen it, and we never did. So, okay, so like, wait, I, I don't wait, like let me further this. Now, Choke, the movie Choke. People say, oh, it's this amazing documentary where this guy puts everything on the line. He's sitting in a cold river and he's doing all these meditative stuff. All of it very cool. 
albeit you're looking at somebody that has such severe anxiety. This isn't like the Zen of some sort of master. This is somebody that's coming unglued that has to do these extra stuff to calm themselves down because they're so nervous and they're going into a fight. There's nothing wrong with being nervous going into a fight, but when it's perpetuated, Hickson by armbar, Hickson by armbar. Well, come on. Like, like I said, like I said, there's enough, there's enough legitimate people on the mat that defend him. That, that and I believe down. that I, I, I wouldn't answer. I wouldn't answer. On the mat. Definitive. You make definitive statements. That's your choice. I can't. I. I'm not there. I can't make a definitive statement when there's that quality people that do side with him. As opposed, you know, I'm not against Mark Coleman. Mark Coleman is obviously not on Hickson's side. He, he feels, hey, I'll, you know, too big, too strong, too fast, you know, and that's probably good. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, where it comes from. I'm not against what Coleman says. I, I may even believe that. But I do know I, that there are a lot from. of people that yeah. have made right. their in the business that think the opposite. And that's cause for pause as an analyst. You know, so okay. that's so on my end. No, no, on my end. Everything you said, you cannot dispute. You know what I mean? It's And it's very well said, articulate. I think where it comes, but where my issue comes from, is that I'm mad that I didn't get to see it happen. Emotion. Truth emotion. be told. I think I think maybe that's where it comes from. It's more of a yeah, an emotional thing, but it's true. I, you know, I, I'm mad. You can be mad be at told. God for not giving us round trip 10 years earlier, you know what I mean? Or MMA 10 years earlier. So maybe we could have seen Ron as the first forefather or Dr. Death as yeah. the first yeah. MMA guy in wrestling, not Dan Severn. So, you know, everything has that bittersweetness. And yes, that's why I think. Hickson will always remain that that figure that we don't just don't know. We just don't know. Yeah, but um, a lot of it we don't know because he didn't want to show us. Like he never competed in the ADCC. Um, there was some tragedy. You know, like I said, even with in round trips, I, I give him all the respect in the world. What he had to deal with, like on, on a family level of, tra- of of tragedy, having suffered the loss of a loved one, the the mother of my child. I get that. I get that. And it's not something that you go, oh, well, he didn't fight Sakuraba. Only his, you know, he he had that incredible tragedy in his family. That's not correct either. And I would never, ever go down that road. So I I guess my protests are more respectful protests than they are right now. My understanding was, and I may be wrong, but I, I believe that the Sakuraba match was signed. In other words, he was going to do it, and then his son disappeared. His, His son passed, yeah. But yeah, yeah, they disappeared and then they found him later after months, you know. Um yeah. Henzo yeah. Gracie identified his body in the New York City morgue. So um, you know, that yeah, it's a shame. Know, I mean, truly know, a tragedy. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you don't know the story, then you know that gives you a little taste of what that tragedy really is. But you know, it comes down to was if, if he had signed a contract for the Sakuraba match and that happened. You know, you have to you have to give him a, a little bit of a buy. You can't a say, pass. You know, yeah, no, for sure. Take sure. two years off and come to it. You know, and that, that that is a uh, something. Well, that here, maybe no. let's add to it. Let's add to it. Also, he was also older than a lot of other people. So, kind of like Ron Tripp, well, if UFC was your ten years earlier, him and Doctor Death they may have been UFC champions. You could absolutely make that same argument for Hickson because he was a little bit older than everybody else, and he was competing against younger guys. Which I do, you know that, that is a distinct advantage of well as well. So I, I, yeah, I, I agree. You hit on on a very strong point there, and you know, obviously the passing of, of Hoxon is a life altering thing. He never. You know, there was never talk of him competing no. again after that or anything like that. And you can and you can't blame him. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think I think you picked out and I, I'm not being disrespectful to that level of loss. But I do think another life changing moment for Hickson may have been that lost to Ron Tripp. I think you're very That's what I'm thinking. Very I mean, it's it, it, it's in the right place at the right time with the, with the guy that's a little bit fragile. Let's not, let's not let's talk about that. He's a little bit fragile when it talk, comes to competition. And, and you know, just like Mark Schultz got a taste of jiu-jitsu early, you know, maybe Hickson, you know, locked up with a 240-pound American wrestler 
early and realized, holy cow, when these guys yeah, come yeah. over, who knows? Who knows? And who knows at what level of the subconscious that may have happened? Oh, but my I do God. Think, I do think there's a possibility that that, that little encounter there uh, where – he got played for by at his own game, you know. He's he's the guy who walks in with the attitude and stuff, and it didn't last long, as from all, every, all accounts, you know. So, dude, dude, round trip didn't even know he beat Hicks and Gracie until years later. <laughs> yeah, I think you know. I mean, that's what a freaking monster how he be, is. How can you be? You know, is that a boss? That's a boss, man. He, he's like, yeah, I beat Hicks and Gracie. Apparently. It, Wait, did you beat this guy? Yeah, that's him. <laughs> you know, come yeah, I on. Think him. <laughs> so, so fantastic stuff. Uh, Ron Tripp, a that'd guy. Be a good little clip, Miguel. That'd be a nice little clip to put for Monday. I'll get on the thumbnail. Thank you, Doctor Ron Tripp. Thank you to yeah. all the wrestlers, all the listeners out there, and definitely to the historians. This one's for you guys. Yep. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.